Thanks, Ravi. I'm going to shoehorn uh, some fairly complicated growth economics into about seven minutes. Uh, I want to start with the uh, observation which uh, Paul Krugman made uh, 20 years ago uh, when he did a very critical assessment of uh, East Asian development and he sort of divided growth into two categories, growth that was driven by perspiration and growth that was driven mainly by inspiration. Perspiration meaning that it was mainly factor supplies that were responsible for growth. Inspiration being that much of growth came from ideas, technological change, and productivity gains. And so if I look back at the period from roughly the mid-50s till about the mid-80s or thereabouts, I see growth uh, as mainly uh, seen as being driven by perspiration. Capital was at the center of uh, most economic thinking at that time. And uh, capital was seen as being driving growth through industrialization, with industrialization to a significant extent being directed by the government or conducted by the government, uh, and industrialization that was sheltered by a variety of uh, tracks and other barriers. And as a consequence of this approach, this perspiration-led approach, uh, you had approximately 20 years of what I think Stephen Marglin called a golden age of growth. And that continued till, up, till about the early 70s when you have a break point, and the break point was the first oil crisis. Thereafter, for nearly 15 years or thereabouts, both developed countries and developing countries had a slowdown in growth. And that slowdown in growth uh, led to a lot of concerns, uh, worries about, you know, declining sort of potency of the, of the, of the growth uh, system, and uh, looking around for alternatives. And again, there was a resurgence here of interest in market-led approaches, market-led approaches with a smaller government, and you had a number of champions, particularly from the Chicago School, who were extremely persuasive, who were extremely erudite, people like Friedman, Stigler, um, Roma, uh, Becker, and many others. And the thing is, they struck a chord. They struck a chord not only with the economics profession, by and large, but they struck a chord with important leaders. So they essentially were able to bring on board Mrs. Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, and if I have to have a break point in, from the perspiration to the, what I will call the inspiration-led uh, growth theory, I will take 1984 when British Telecom was, uh, was privatized by Mrs. Thatcher, and thereafter you have, I think, a gravitational shift in thinking on economics and a change in, uh, in approach. And this approach was more market, more emphasis on technology and ideas, more emphasis on human capital, and more emphasis on productivity as the long-term driver of growth and not capital. And as a consequence of, of this big shift, which was then slowly sort of weaved its way into the, or found its way into the bloodstream of thinking and affected uh, economic policy, you have what I would say another 20 years almost of reasonably rapid rates of growth worldwide. And so I would say there were five or six reasons why this happened. As I've mentioned, one was dissatisfaction with growth. Two was the emergence of a powerful, I would say, ideological current of thinking coming out mainly from Chicago, but also Minnesota and elsewhere. Uh, third was, I think, uh, I think uh, Homie's also mentioned it, the fall of the Berlin Wall, which discredited uh, the statist approach to development. Uh, fourth, I would say, is that the Chinese embrace of market-led approaches, I think, had a big impact on others because not only did they embrace it, but they, found, they showed that it could succeed. Uh, then again, if you look at what the East Asians were doing, during the 80s, even a country like Korea was gradually stepping back from the top-down industrial policy which had followed in the past <coughs> and moving towards a much more market-oriented approach. So that, again, had a big impact on all other countries that were observing East Asia and seeing East Asia as a model of development for them. So you had all of these things, plus, of course, you had globalization. 
and globalization with deregulation, removal of so many barriers, the opening up of opportunities for trade and growth through uh, you know, export-led uh, initiatives, all of these things had a big impact. And so from thereafter, through roughly till about 2008, you have what I would call the inspiration-led theory uh, leading uh, growth economics. And then we come to the current juncture, and I'd like to end with a few comments on that, which is that um, from roughly the end of the East Asian crisis onwards, you have a growing dissatisfaction even amongst East Asian countries that the growth isn't as good as it could be, that they could have done better, and then they look back in the past, they were doing better. And the question for them is, um, can, is there another approach that we can take? And a hankering back to the, uh, ex to the industrial policies of the past. And the fact of the matter is that that top-down industrial policy no longer has any traction because manufacturing, which was the past driver of growth, no longer can be seen as a driver of growth in the future. But in addition, what has happened is that economic theory has moved off in directions which are, I think, in some sense, somewhat sterile. Firstly, there's been this enormous emphasis on uh, institutions, institutions that harken back several hundred years and are difficult to modify in current circumstances. Uh, the second thing is the research which, which has been done on growth accelerations. I think this work, which is one I associate with Pritchett, with Hausman and Roderick, with Easterly, and with Summers, shows that growth accelerations are very difficult to pin down to policy. That they can happen because of a variety of shocks and so forth. And that most of these growth accelerations peter out. And that there is an inevitable tendency towards a regression to the mean. And that, in a sense, ought to be uh, a warning to all of the East Asian countries who are worrying about middle income traps, who are thinking about restoring the rates of growth which they had in the past. None of that is likely to happen because the facts from the past speak very clearly that growth does regress to the mean, that there's very little correlation between growth in any one decade and growth in another decade. Lastly, a lot of the economic thinking also seems to have come up with ideas which are somewhat difficult to understand to, to, to translate into policy. One is the importance given to culture and the growth of social capital. And most uh, unusually, there is the recent emphasis on things like genetic distance and genetic diversity, which one sees coming up in the Journal of Economic Perspective and the Journal of Economic <laughs> Literature, which one looks at and says, is economics, which is now drifting off in this direction towards institutions, towards these kinds of ideas, is it going to provide ammunition for policymakers who would like to see high growth being restored? And in particular, how are these policymakers going to square their desire for rapid growth with the empirical evidence that is coming out on growth accelerations and the factors behind growth accelerations, in particular, the weakness of policy in this regard. Thank you.